unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha, a co-production of the Hindustan Times and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. Modi's India, Hindu nationalism, and the rise of ethnic democracy is a comprehensive exploration of the Narendra Modi government, its origins, policies, philosophy, and relationship to democracy. Patrick Heller of Brown University calls the book the most detailed, theoretically sophisticated, and comprehensive analysis of the rise of Modi's BJP as a dominant electoral force. The author of the book is Christoph Jafferlow. Christoph is no stranger to this podcast, having most recently joined us earlier this year to discuss his book, India's First Dictatorship, about the emergency under Indira Gandhi. Christoph is Director of Research at Seri Sciences Po, CNRS, Professor at King's College London, and a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment. He joins me today from Paris. Christoph, welcome back, and congratulations on the book. Thank you, Milan. Thank you for the invitation. So before we get into the heart of the book, um, I think it's useful for our listeners for you to tell us a little bit about the origins of the book. Uh, most of us who know you know that you have been watching Narendra Modi for a very long time. You have been studying Gujarat, traveling to Gujarat for decades now. You've also written extensively on the BJP, the RSS, and the broader changes to the Indian party system. After decades of working on each of these topics, you know, what moved you to author, you know, a 650 page uh, analysis of Modi and his government? What was missing from what was out there? What was the kind of niche that you wanted to fill? Well, this is a very good question. The, the main reason why I did this book is that I found the existing literature rather incomplete, I must say. And uh, few people call a spade a spade. So I thought we needed a book trying to make sense of how Modi's politics is transforming India. A book that is not a biography of Modi and which does not focus only on BGP's electoral performances, but a book that is presenting the larger picture. How Modi rose to power in Gujarat first and then in India. How did he change BGP? and the Sangh Parivar at large, what kind of populism does he epitomize, what kind of authoritarianism uh, does he uh, embody, and in particular, how the state and vigilante groups work together in Modi's India, and what has been the impact of these politics on society, on the minorities, on the institutions, on the NGOs, on the university system. So. That was that was the objective, and that's why the book is so long, because it tries to be comprehensive, and it is based on a lot of data. You know, I believe in facts. I really believe in evidence-based, evidence-supported arguments. So there are many statistical data. There are dozens of interviews. Sometimes I've not revealed the name of the people I interviewed. But that's why there are also 100 pages of footnotes. So before we get to Modi in Delhi, uh, you recount Modi's rise from a provincial politician and how he catapulted from the state of Gujarat to the national stage. Uh, I, I want to ask you about a very interesting anecdote you have, um, which relates to the circumstances in which Modi was first made chief minister of Gujarat. I was surprised to learn that, you know, Modi was actually very reluctant to take the job at first. So then Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee offered it to him. Uh, and Modi said, look, this is not my work. I've been away from Gujarat for six years. I'm not familiar with the issues. You know, what am I going to do there? It is not a field of my liking. I don't know anyone. Now, anyone who has seen Narendra Modi over the past seven or eight years, um, you know, he, he doesn't strike you as reluctant to do anything, right? So why do you think he was so unsure about taking on this particular post back in 2001? Yeah, that's an interesting episode. And it goes beyond uh, an anecdote. It's more than that. Uh, to respond to this question, I, I would factor in two variables. First of all, Modi in 2001 was not a politician. He was a Pracharak, an organizer, who despised politicians, like so many other RSS scatters. 
And as a Sangatan Mantri, as an organizing secretary, he exerted power from behind the sea. He had never fought an election. And to become chief minister, he had to. And that was not something easy for him in 2001. And that's the second explanation I would give. Modi was not welcome back in Gujarat in 2001, in BGP at that time. You know, he had been forced to leave the state after Vagela had made um, Keshubhai Patel's government fall. He had been accused of mismanagement. Keshubhai was not happy to be eased out and hand over the post of CM to him. And in fact, many other BGP leaders were not happy to see him back. Uh, he had a tough time to find an MLA seat, for instance. He wanted to contest from Ellis Bridge, but Aren Pandya, uh, who was to be assassinated two years later, refused to resign. He had to go to Rashkot. So it's an interesting and I would say educative episode because it shows that what retrospectively seems so odd, in fact, forces us to historicize. So after Modi won re-election in Gujarat in 2012, you might remember you and I were both there in December 2012 and we in fact met uh, several times. I do. At that point, it was very clear that upon his election victory, he was going to pivot to the national stage uh, and would likely be the odds-on favorite to, to be the BJP's prime ministerial face in 2014. Now, many election observers who had followed the BJP throughout the 90s and 2000s thought that the BJP had already peaked and that was in a, in a process of gradual decline, right? It had un, unable to grow its national vote share, unable to form the government in 2004 and again in 2009. Tell us a bit about the BJP, the party that Modi was inheriting in 2014, and what innovations he introduced to kind of remake the party in his own image. Yes, um, indeed. Many people in 2012 thought that BJP was declining for good. Um, I never thought that BGP was in such a bad situation. In fact, because I never looked at BGP alone. And in contrast to, to many of my colleagues, and that's where to do fieldwork makes a big difference. Because when you do fieldwork, you see that BGP is part of a much larger organization, the Song Parival. And uh, the last sentence of my first book in 1996 was precisely on this. It said, look, BGP is not winning elections, but the Song Parivar is expanding. And that will inevitably help BGP uh, at the time of elections. So BGP was not uh, alone, far from that, because of these organizations. But it's not as if it was only depending upon directives from RSS. No, there is an autonomy, a real autonomy uh, at, at the party level. And in 2012, this autonomy allowed the party leader, LK Advani, to stick to a tactic. I would not call that a strategy, but a tactic. A tactic relying on the NDA. For LK Advani, BGP had to remain at the helm of a coalition and would never win except in a coalition. And just for our listeners who are not initiated, the NDA was the National Democratic Alliance, of which the BJP was the principal party. Exactly, a coalition arcing back to the late 1990s. And Modi suggested an alternative plan based on what he had achieved in Gujarat. And polarization was the keyword, if you want. Um, he claimed that BJP could win a majority of seats by being true to Indudva and not dilute Indudva the way Advani, because of the NDA, was forced to dilute Indudva. You know, that was a very innovative way to put things. Because for all of us, Indian politics had a centrist trap. You know, all of us had learned from Suzanne and Lord Rudolph that you win elections not by being an extreme party, but a centrist party. And Modi did something completely different, radicalizing 
polarizing. And, and, and in the book, I show that, in fact, he has invalidated the famous moderation thesis that not only the Rudolphs, but many other people are using in uh, political science across the globe, because across the globe, things are changing. And populism means, in many cases, polarization, and, and it works. So let me just ask you about this, because, you know, one of the things many people have noted about the 2014 campaign is that uh, Modi portrayed himself as a moderate. In fact, he he talked about Vikas development. He talked about good governance. He talked about how it wasn't the business of the government to be in business, right? He talked about uh, reforms in a general sense, not in a specific sense. And so in many ways, you can argue, and people like Ashutosh Varshini and others have said this, is that in the national theater of politics, the 2014 campaign did not seem to be based on Hindutva, Hindu nationalism. It seemed to be pitched at making a broader play for a, a, a pan-Indian coalition. Is that a fair assessment? Well, yes and no. Yes, but I will begin with the no. <laughs> no, because I do think that in 2014, he did not need to do too much on the Hindutva side. You know, he was the man who had presided over the 2002 pogrom. And this is something that kept coming back in all the interviews, in all the comments, and he never said sorry, and he, and he never apologized for what had happened. Uh, plus, of course, you may also remember that during the election meetings, Muslims were given burqas and, and uh, uh, um, topi caps to be seen as separate within those who were part of the audience. And he went to Varanasi, and that was not by chance the way he chose his own constituency. So Indudva was definitely the subtext of, of the 2014 campaign. Now, certainly it was not only about that. And, and this is where, this is where it is absolutely a new political animal on the Hindu nationalist side, because it's Hindu nationalism, it's Hindutva plus, plus populism. Mostly, this is the trump card that he could use in 2014. And it, this is something he had tried before in, in Gujarat, the populist repertoire, which means that I am representing the people against the elite. And in Gujarat, it worked very well, you know. It was against Delhi. Delhi was uh, exploiting Gujarat, marginalizing Gujarat. And in Delhi, you had uh, a dynasty, this, the, the uh, Gandhi, uh, Nehru, or the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, uh, who uh, were uh, not only um, elite, English speaking, foreign elite, uh, but, but also pro Muslims. And he called Delhi, the Delhi Sultanate, and he called Sonia Gandhi Pasta Bain. And in contrast to these establishment figures, he was a son of the soil. He was a man of the plebeian side. Now, never before BGP had someone who could say, I am a former Pracharak, but I'm a former Chaivala also. I'm an OBC, a backward caste man. I come from a very plebeian milieu. So he could stand and appear as different, a victim, a victim like the people, a victim of the English-speaking media, NDTV, a victim of the Khan Market Gang, what he will say later on. You know, this is the plus vote that he brings to BGP. Uh, he, he can appear as a man of the people, he is like me, and a superhero, a real Marut, you know, very, uh, you can say, virile, uh, uh, a man endowed with supernatural powers. So uh, let me ask you a little bit about this cult of personality or charismatic authority, because one of the questions that was doing the rounds, particularly between 2014 and 2019, was, you know, what is the precise equation between Modi and the Sangh Parivar, right? This constellation of Hindu nationalist organizations led by, fueled by the RSS. Now, some people said, look, they're basically two sides of the same coin because Modi 
was a foot soldier, as it were, in, in the RSS, in the Hindu nationalist movement. But you write in your own book that Modi actually upset many in the RSS, and you, you spoke about this earlier, because he had this larger-in-life persona, right, which went against the RSS ethos of collectivism, of humility, of knowing your place. And so how do we think about the dynamics between Modi, the leader, the prime minister, and the RSS, the organization? Yes, we need to do some history again, because um, everything begins again uh, in, in Gujarat. Uh, in 2007, the RSS was upset indeed. Modi did not report to the Pran Pracharak. He did not submit to him the list of candidates for the state elections. He refused to accommodate Keshubhai Patel, who was defeated when he contested for the post of party president of uh, BGP of Gujarat. And he alienated the Bhartiya Kisan Union uh, when he increased uh, the electricity tariffs, the BKS being the peasants' wing of RSS. And in spite of the fact that RSS tried to mediate, Arun Jetli rushed to Gujarat, Modi never compromised. But he won the 2007 elections. And for me, it's a turning point because Modi showed that he could win without the RSS support. He could win because he had other channels of communication. You know, he had uh, other advisors, including uh, people com coming from the PR company, APCO Worldwide. He could win because he had his own network of IT specialists and uh, social media and so on. In a way, he had short-circuited the organization. And this is typical of what the populists do. Populists don't need political parties. And when they do, they are their own creations in many ways. On the one hand, yes, his personal style is not the cup of tea of RSS. That is a much more collegial organization that does not believe in personality cult. No, you can't even name the RSS chiefs. Uh, they've been many, they have come, they have gone. They don't matter. On the other end, of course, RSS is happy with what Modi does because they have their own power in the corridor of po their own people in the corridor of power. And they have uh, a lot of influence in domains very dear to them, like education, and they see their agenda implemented one item after the other. Article 370 being abolished, the Ayodhya temple being built. So RSS having a long-term perspective, they may be back in the, in the driver's seat. The real question probably then will be, how can you rebuild the party, a party where power has been so centralized? And Congress never recovered from this kind of concentration of power under Indira. But RSS is a cadre, is a very rich, is very rich in cadre. It's a really, really a cadre based organization, something Congress never was. So new leaders may emerge from its ranks. They will get the best of what Modi will have given to them, and they will wait for new opportunities for being again uh, in the driver's seat. Let me ask you about the broader ideological project, Christoph, because the RSS since the early 20th century has uh, been very clear about its desire to bring about a Hindu Rashtra, right, which you define is essentially an idea based on uh, the definition of a nation that uh, in, in which, you know, Hindu culture uh, is uh, is essentially synonymous with with Indian culture, right? So it is self-regulating, not necessarily based on the established constitutional foundations. Uh, we had last year the scholar Vinay Sitapati, author of the book Jugobandi on the BJP before Modi, a book I know that you know very well. You know, one of the things he says is, look, actually the BJP and the RSS don't have a theory of the state, as it were. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, if you agree with this assessment that once they come to power, yes, they have this vague idea about a Hindu Rashtra, but do they have a governance agenda? 
I think the first thing I, I would say here is that um, RSS does not pay much attention to the state apparatus because what matters the most is society. Right? Society seen as a living organism, a potentially harmonious wall. And, and the main ideologue of RSS, Dindayal Upadhyay, made no mystery of the fact that this societal model was the Varna system, the caste system, the ideal caste system. And by contrast, he attacked the state that Nehru and Ambedkar were developing because this state was the instrument of reforms for development and for more equality, social reforms. So the fact that RSS focuses on society is clear at the expense of the state and the, and the modus operandi of the organization it makes it even clearer. You know, we want on the shaka in the branch of the song to create a new man. What matters is society that will be built on this new man. It's also what you see in a very different way through the uh, vigilante groups that RSS is sponsoring, including Bajrangdal. Bajrangdal is a very important uh, addition to the Song Parivar. I, I dwell on this organization in the book for that reason. It's a cultural police, in a way, trying to implement uh, the uh, best practices that Hindus should cultivate. They fight decent intercaste marriages, love jihad, as they say, and the fact that some Muslims are accused of seducing uh, young Hindus. So this is revealing for me of one definition of the state, if you want, and even one theory of the state. They believe in a form of authority that is legitimate because rooted in cultural values and in Hinduism. And they do it legitimately at the expense of the legality of the official state. In a way, they are a parallel state at the local level. It does not mean that they ignore the state. And what we see today is an attempt at making the parallel state, the, if you want, legitimate state and the legal state working together. So let me ask you about the legal state, because you devote uh, quite a lot of attention in the book to the weakening or decay of Indian institutions, especially those that might provide a check on executive power, right? But what's interesting is that in many cases, your argument is not that the BJP eliminated un institutions or undid institutions. It is that many of these institutions, take the judiciary, for example, as one that you highlight, actually abdicated, self-abdicated their responsibilities of their own volition. So this, to me, is a pretty big puzzle, right? Why would independent institutions willingly cede control to another branch of government? Unlike what's happened in some parts of the world, uh, the, 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 the remit of the Supreme Court has not changed, right? Uh, the, the court has not been explicitly packed with sycophants, right? So there's something more nuanced and more complicated going on. Yes, very sophisticated. And uh, indeed, this chapter is one of the most important chapters for me in this book, precisely because I try to unpack uh, this complexity. What I study in the book is the process that has affected uh, the Central Information Commission, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the National Investigation Commission, the Election Commission, and of course, the Supreme Court and, and the Indian Parliament. And in the case of the first uh, institutions I've just listed, clearly there are different techniques for weakening them. First of all, you can dilute their mission. And the RTI Act has been diluted, for instance. Or you can let post remain vacant. You have nobody to do the job. The institution is weak for that reason. Or you can also replace some of those who were in charge by other state functionaries who would be more pliable. 
Alok Verma, the former CBI chief, Ashok Lavasa, the former election commissioner, are cases in point. And interestingly, both of them have been spied by the Pegasus spyware, uh, which is not, uh, I think, uninteresting. So these institutions have been weakened uh, by resorting to different strategies. And of course, the successors got the message when the successors have not been selected on purpose anyway. The case of the judiciary is more complex. And, and there again, the question of appointments is key because remember, Gopal Surmanium could not be appointed to the Supreme Court in spite of his selection by the Collegium. That was a first in the spring uh, of 2014. And after him, dozens of judges could not be appointed either at the high court level. And I give the complete list in the book. So appointing the appointment of, of judges is one way to weaken the judiciary, the way you select or delay or uh, refuse uh, the appointment of judges. But there are other interesting elements in the case of the judiciary that need to be mentioned. One is a kind of politicization of the judiciary. Because we see among those who have been appointed, uh, judges who are very close to the Song Pariva, who have even been part of the Adivakt Parishad, you know, the uh, branch of the Song Pariva uh, specializing in, in, in the judiciary, like A.K. Goyal or you are Lalit. And you have others, Arun Mishra, for instance, who appeared publicly in the company of PGP leaders. So that's another new development that makes this, the proximity of some judges with um, Hindu nationalist leaders uh, obvious. And then you have another very important uh, factor for a decline of the neutrality of the judges, that is the expectation of post-retirement jobs. When a judge knows that he'll get something after retirement, because the government will have appreciated the way it would have worked, then of course you create the conditions for some bias. In fact, Arun Jaitley himself said, this is undermining the judiciary. Yes, it is. And last but not least, of course, but that's something that would take us too far. Prashant Bhushan argues that some judges have been blackmailed because many of them are not completely clean. And that's another possibility. So, uh, you know, this all begs the question, Christoph, that some of these pathologies are not new, right? And so for some people who have read your last two books, this book on Modi, the previous book on the emergency under Mrs. Gandhi, might conclude that what we're seeing today in Indian politics is a kind of reversion to the mean. In other words, in a previous era, you had a strong leader who was able to subvert institutions, trample on basic freedoms, establish a cult of personality, you then had a 25-year period of coalition politics, dispersed power, where things look differently. But now we're back in the previous mode uh, with, with a strong dominant party and a strong dominant leader. So what is so new in your mind about this moment compared to previous periods where you've had executive dominance and a charismatic prime minister? I do think that during the emergency time and... Um, and, and today, there, there were three pillars which were similar, uh, a concentration of power, uh, a political economy that was very much uh, based on uh, cronies and chronic capitalism, and some privatization of violence. But there are two major differences, and I think uh, that's why we cannot compare uh, today's India and, and, and the emergency years. First of all, Mrs. Gandhi had no long-term plan when she declared the emergency. It was a survival exercise, and she could not rely on any organization. No. On the contrary, the Song Parivar is benefiting from Modi's popularity with a long-term objective, to transform India into a Hindu Rashtra, and its organization is huge. So that makes a very clear difference. And the second big difference is that the emergency was, of course, much more draconian. Censorship was very strict. There were 100,000 political prisoners. Masterization was the order of the day. 
General elections were suspended. Well, that's a very important dimension. Elections are not suspended in India. On the contrary, they are very important to what I call a populist regime. You know, we are seeing across the globe a new type, a new type of political regime that is taking shape. And I can call them populist regime because they rely on elections. The charismatic leader needs elections to renew his or her legitimacy. Of course, he has to win. And to make sure that he wins, he will make the competition uneven by uh, collecting more money than anybody else, by saturating the, the, the public space. But there'll be elections, and this is a, a major feature. There'll be elections to renew the legitimacy of the leader, but also to show the world that you are on the right side. And the, to organize election allows Narendra Modi to tell the world India is the world's largest democracy, something that is, of course, very important when the West is looking for partners for containing China in the name of values, in the name of democracy. Uh, let me just ask you about the media, Christophe, because, um, you know, you argued that uh, the, what we see today uh, is a much more pliant media, a media whose freedoms in some ways have been restricted, and that the press generally in India, you argue in the book, no longer functions as the fourth pillar of democracy. Now, many people who support the government would respond to that by saying, well, look, uh, Christoph Jaffrelo can write this in his book, but he himself has a regular spot on the Indian Express op-ed page. He writes for numerous print and online publications. Uh, no one is censoring him. So can it really be said that the media is muzzled? Well, Indian Express, online publications, frankly speaking, that this is not what populist leaders are most interested in. Uh, they can leave that precisely to critiques. What they focus upon is television. And what we see in India today is um, a restriction of pluralism on this side of the media, television. So in the book, I study the different ways in which uh, the government can influence these uh, power centers that TV channels have become. They can do it by using government ads, by intimidating critics via IT raids or ED raids, uh, by filling dozens of sedition cases against journalists in UP, for instance, by putting pressure on the owners of channels for easing out journalists. The, the way P.P. Bajpai was sacked by the proprietor of ABP News is a case in point. And I'm not mentioning the way TV anchors like Ravish Kumar uh, arrest TV, Ravish Kumar from NDTV one of the last uh, critical uh, TV channel. So those who have his courage resist, the others give up. And this is why diversity is not what it used to be on ZTV or Times Now, for instance. But the most interesting case, of course, is Republic TV. Republic TV is a fascinating phenomenon. Uh, it has been founded by, by a man who is now part of the government of India. Um, and of course, the TV claimed to be, this channel claims to be informative. But in the book, um, we have scrutinized uh, with uh, Bihang Jumli the role of uh, this channel during the 2019 election campaign. And it's difficult to find a more biased coverage, really. So. On the one hand, you have uh, a way to circumvent or circumscribe channels which used to be independent. And on the other hand, you have the promotion of a new, uh, a new version of Fox News in many ways. Uh, Christoph, let me bring this conversation to an end by asking one final question about the broader system in India, right? You know, many of us 
after the 2014 and particularly after the 2019 elections wrote about the dawn of a new party system, what we called the fourth party system, which was the era that that kind of consolidated BJP rule uh, after a period, a prolonged period, really, of coalition politics. You take a different tact. You argue that it's not just a new party system, it's a new political system. And I'm wondering if you could distill for us why you make this distinction, because it's an important distinction. Um, and it seems to me to transcend just political competition to something much broader. Certainly, this is absolutely key. And I would say that a new political system is taking shape in India for um, four reasons that I will list uh, briefly. One is political competition is not a level playing field anymore. For the reasons I've mentioned above before, uh, the uh, uh, way the election commission, for instance, has lost some of its uh, autonomy, but for other reasons as well, and I will mention only one, that is money power. And, and, and Milan, you know <laughs> this question even better than me. When BGP can spend $3.6 billion in the 2019 election campaign, it spends more than all its competitors. And this is partly because of an innovation he has initiated that is called election bonds. So that's one way also to connect to another dimension that I have alluded to. This new political system is as its own political economy. Crony capitalism is part of it. And uh, the business model that Narendra Modi initiated in Gujarat with Gautam Adani and many others has become the order of the day. And the wave of privatization that we are seeing today is just reconfirming that, yes, the competition is unfair, partly because the money power and, and political power are more and more uh, together. Secondly, and more importantly, because we have not mentioned this so far, but for me it's very important, this new political system can be called majoritarian. Majoritarian in the sense that it develops a new kind of access to citizenship. And the CAA is a case in point. For the first time, religion is a criterion to be eligible to Indian citizenship. And, the, and that's the Citizenship Amendment Act, or yes, CAA. Yes, exactly, passed in 2019. Uh, and the last chapter of the book is about the situation of Indian Muslims. So I have built data sets about their representation in the administration, in the police, and in the parliament. And you see uh, how Muslims have been marginalized, especially in uh, the Lok Sabha, where for the first time in the history of India, the ruling party has no uh, Muslim MP. So if you want... This is a new political system where secularism is on the paper, but multiculturalism not uh, implemented anymore. Third, concentration of power in the hands of few people, I think is a symptom of a change of the political system because it's at the expense of the government and ministerial competence. It's at the expense of parliament, and I give data about the way parliament is bypassed today. You cannot say India is a parliamentary democracy the way it used to be. And it's at the expense of federalism. And last but not least, in a liberal democracy, freedom is a key value. You know, the political system changes for good when a democracy does not observe freedom of the individual, uh, as, as much as, as it should. And what we are seeing with the Pegasus story that has been remarkably underreported is that India has spied journalists, opponents, intellectuals, social workers, and uh, that has resulted in the arrest of the 16 Bima Koregaon accused, for instance, years ago. But that has not resulted in uh, any uh, investigation after the Pegasus uh, story uh, came out. Now, there is an important bill 
that will be tabled in Parliament in the coming weeks or months, hopefully, the privacy bill. And it will be very important to see where is the cursor, where is the red line in terms of defense of individual freedom and, and, and privacy. Uh, this is, by the way, something the rest of the world is watching very closely because the flows of data that the IT sector of India will be eligible to, to some extent, will be a function of the seriousness of this privacy bill. But that's the business part of the story. The political part of the story is a political system that claims to be democratic needs to protect the private life of its citizens. And this is something the Supreme Court has recommended. Now the law has to be, uh, I would say, finalized. The bill has to be passed. And, and we'll see where India stands on this, uh, on this front. But these are the four reasons why I think that we need to go beyond the party system. It's not a question of political parties only. There is much more at stake. My guest on the show this week is the political scientist Christoph Jaffrelo. He is the author most recently of Modi's India, Hindu Nationalism and the Rise of Ethnic Democracy, published in the United States by Princeton University Press. Christoph, it is always a joy to have you on and an education. Congratulations on the book and thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Milan. And I'm glad to say that the book is also available in India now because Amazon India is publishing it uh, this month. So we will link to that in the show notes so our listeners can find it. Thanks again, Christoph. Thank you. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we reference on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Caroline Duckworth, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff J. Pranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast